If they didn't hear you, you are good to go. Take it away, Alex. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for being patient with this technology. You'd think after, what, two and a half years of, of this, we'd be a lot better at it. But uh I want to talk to you guys a lot today about the changes that are coming to the HVACR industry and making sure that you as contractors, technicians, you know, companies in this industry are ready for the changes and can take advantage of those. We want to make sure that uh, you know, being prepared is the best way to uh, not have any of these changes disproportionately disaffect your, your businesses. Uh, so a little bit to start off, I want to uh, just prepare you for what the outcomes are for today. You know, first off, uh, you know, 2023 is coming. And so we want to make sure that you guys are aware of the new energy efficiency requirements uh, for residential. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about commercial as well. Cooling products uh, and primarily they're distinguished between SEER and the new SEER 2. Uh, also going to talk about some new uh, tax incentives through tax rebates or excuse me, incentives through tax rebates and uh, tax, excuse me, tax credits and rebates for HVAC products that you guys can take advantage of, uh, not only this year, next year, but over the next few years uh, to help sell uh, various products. And then lastly, uh, do a deep dive into the upcoming HFC transition, moving away from our common refrigerants that we're using today, like R410A, uh, and into new refrigerants, uh, and, and what dates to expect some of those transitions. Uh, also looking at you know the flammability properties of A2Ls, our mildly flammable refrigerants, uh, and then what operations changes, if any, that you'll have to do uh, with this transition. So uh, the big thing is, you know, what does the future of HVACR look like? Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, 2023 regional standards take place next year. Uh, we also get these new tax credits and rebates. Uh, and then 2024, we're going to see uh, our first major step in the HFC phase down. We're going to see a 40% reduction uh, in production and consumption. Uh, for those of you in the commercial market, you'll start to see uh, transitions likely for chillers into low GWP refrigerants. Then in 2025, we're looking at the transition for uh, all of your um, residential and light commercial equipment into low GWP refrigerants. In addition to that, we also have issues like the the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, a lot of those provisions expire uh, in 2026. Uh, possibly a new furnace rule that uh, recently just the comment period closed on that coming into somewhere around 2028, maybe 2029. Another step down in our HFC phase down in 2029. Uh, our second to last one in 2034. And then finally, uh, moving down to that 15 percent baseline uh, of HFC production in 2036. So there is a lot happening over the next uh, would be 14 years, uh, but really want to prepare you guys for what I just had on that previous slide, looking at that next three years of time. And so to start off, uh, looking at 2023, uh, there's uh, a lot of, uh, I don't want to say call it anger, but uh, unhappy thoughts about this transition. And what the reason for that is because we're really going through two transitions at once. Um, we've had previous energy efficiency transitions that were relatively smooth because all we were doing was increasing that efficiency level. We were going from one standard to a, to a new standard very easy. This time around, we're doing that increase, but we're also changing how we measure that increase. So moving from uh, SEER to SEER2, EER to EER2, and then HSPF to HSPF. This is what we call the M1 transition. This is the M1 appendix that, that DOE publishes. And so moving from 14 SEER is not equal to moving to 14 SEER, uh, SEER 2. It's a completely new set of numbers, uh, and that relates to the test procedure that we use. Um, this is, again, from the M1 uh, appendix that determines how uh, equipment is tested. Under the old SEER model, we used an external static pressure of 0.1. Under the new SEER 2 model, we used an external static pressure of 0.5. So it's not much of a change, but that completely changes what the numbers we use to measure it. Um, I like to think of this as making it more realistic uh, to, to what's in a home. Uh, we knew 0.1 was completely wrong. We know 0.5 is closer, but it, it's not necessarily completely accurate because there's just a lot of uh, things that will change from home to home. Um, but really, you know, if you think about it, if you've ever purchased a new pickup truck and the sticker in the window says it's going to get 25 miles to the gallon, well, in the real world, it gets about 20. 
this is very similar. Uh, this new CR2 is peak efficiency in a, in a lab under those laboratory conditions. In the real world, it's going to be slightly less, but at least we're more accurate than we were under the old SEER system. Now I want to get into what are the new SEER2 requirements uh, for the various types of air conditioning. The first one is the easiest one, package air conditioning. Uh, with this one, we're actually not increasing uh, the efficiency standard. All we're doing is moving to SEER2. Uh, so 14 SEER, which is the new efficient, current efficiency standard, becomes 13.4 SEER2 in the north and south regions. Um, so what's called the nationwide standard, it's still 13.4 in the southwest region, but they also have to have this 10.6 EER2. Um, for you guys in the north, uh, really no change at all. It's just eventually the equipment that you get in stock from your manufacturer, instead of that yellow sticker saying 14 SEER, it's going to say 13.4. Very similarly for uh, split system and package heat pumps, uh, this is a, a nationwide standard uh, where we're moving from SEER to SEER 2. In split system, we are increasing our efficiency. So we are going up to 14.3 SEER 2 and 7.5 HSPF2. But if you're looking at package heat pumps, just like before, no efficiency increase, just moving to the SEER 2 numbers. Um, with this one, though, uh, because heat pumps are a nationwide standard, this is based on the date of manufacture. So there's no need to worry about inventory or anything like that. As long as you can buy it from your distributor or you have it in your warehouse already, you will be able to install it after January 1st, 2023. Now, in split system residential air conditioning, this is where we do run into a date of installation requirement. However, that is only for folks in the south and the southwest. For those of you guys in the north, which should be most of the, the customers uh, on the on the call today, where you live in that north region uh, in the this green map, uh, you have a date of manufacture uh, regulation, so you can install it as long as you have it in stock prior to January 1st, 2023, um, and that's meaning that the manufacturer made it prior to that. Uh, once January 1st, 2023 comes around, Manufacturers will start shipping this new SEER 2 equipment. Uh, it needs to be 13.4 SEER 2, and you'll be able to install that as those come in. But if you have any of that older equipment, don't worry about it. You can continue to install that for as long as possible. Uh, one of the big things that uh, we want to make sure that folks had a good understanding of this transition from SEER to SEER 2. Uh, and so we made basically a cheat sheet. Uh, makes it even easier to understand you know, where you live in the country, what your uh, minimum SEER requirements are from your manufacturer as those they produce that equipment. Uh, and then also understanding if you have old SEER equipment and folks want to understand what is that, does it meet the new efficiency standard? There, that's what this second page is. You'll see that energy guide label. If that says a 15 SEER, that means it is above the uh, uh, minimum for the South and Southwest, which for them, uh, was 15 SEER moving up from 14 SEER. For those of you guys in the north where you're moving from 13 to 14, you really only need to see uh, a 14 SEER on that t tag to know that you are installing something that meets the new standard, uh, even though it might be previously manufactured equipment. On the commercial side, uh, this is all relatively simple. Uh, this is just new uh, numbers. So uh, you know, there is uh, increases, but there's no need to worry about old inventory or anything like that. Um, you know, everything from 14.8 IEER all the way up to 13 IEER. Uh, so this is a new measurement, but uh, for the most part, uh, not much change there because it is uh, based on the date of manufacture. So whatever you guys get from your manufacturer, whether it was before 20, January 1st, 2023 or after, there's no need to worry about uh, whether or not that is legal to install. All of the uh, large commercial equipment, so anything greater than 65,000 BTUs, is based on data manufacture. Uh, so this is for uh, packaged air conditioning units. We also have packaged air conditioning with heat pumps. Uh, have uh, the IEER plus the, the, the COP numbers. Uh, and we'll make sure that you guys have these slides because uh, I just don't want to go into every single number for every single type. It's it's just a lot of information to throw at you. Again, uh, split system air conditioning units, that 13 all the way up to 14.8, uh, and then split system with heat pumps, uh, moving from 12.3 all the way up to 14.1 uh, with that uh, COP number as well. Now, 
always we when we look at uh, increases in efficiency standards, costs go up. Luckily, with the new Inflation Reduction Act that was passed and signed into law, there's a lot of new tax incentives uh, and rebates that are available to consumers. Uh, one that you're probably pretty familiar with, uh, we had a few changes, but uh, something that's been used before is Section 25C. This is the uh, new energy efficiency home credit. Uh, I say new because what they did was they, uh, uh, or excuse me, energy efficient home improvement credit. Uh, this is the uh, new name for an old tax credit. So while the old rules still exist for this year um, that have existed for over a decade, we have new rules starting after January 1st, 2023. And these will be in place for uh, roughly a decade, uh, ending in 2032, where it allows a tax credit for up to 30% of the installation cost on HVAC products, up to a certain amount, depending on your type of product. Um, for your traditional air conditioner, it's $600. Same thing for $600 for a furnace. Those two can be combined for $1,200. Um, you can also do $600 for a boiler. But if you do a heat pump, you can get up to $2,000 in tax credit. Uh, all you have to do is meet the... Uh, efficiency tier uh, based on the uh, Consortium for Energy Efficiency. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know what that is just yet. Um, the Those folks are meeting next week uh, to approve uh, their tier levels. And once we know that information, we can, we can share that with everyone about what equipment will meet this new efficiency tier. Uh, the only other thing to note on this one is that if you're not installing a heat pump, there is a $1,200 limit. So you can do the 600 air conditioner plus the 600 furnace, or you can do a furnace plus a boiler, uh, but not all three of those at the same time uh, to get that 30% of the installation cost. Uh, in addition to uh, 25C, we have section 45L. This is for anyone that does new construction. So new energy efficiency home credit, where if you are participating in the construction of a new home, uh, you are eligible as a contractor to take this credit um, and not just you it could be the general contractor on the home or the the development project um, or you as the hvac uh, contractor but it's only going to be one of you uh, but this one has an interesting twist to it uh, there's two tiers of uh, credit based on how much the employees of the contractors on site are paid um, for if every contractor on the site not just the hvac company but all of them pay um, prevailing wage for that area, uh, you get roughly five times higher tax credit than uh, if, if the companies are not paying uh, prevailing wage. So when we look at a uh, what's called a zero energy ready home, this is the, the highest efficiency rating from DOE. You can get a $5,000 for a single family home, $1,000 per multifamily. But with that prevailing wage on multifamily, you'll get up to $5,000 per unit. Uh, in single family homes, you can get up to $2,500 per home. Um, there is no second tier for prevailing wage on single family homes. They just recognize that but for the most part, if you are building a standalone single family home, it's more of a one off project, smaller contracting firm than large uh, multifamily developments. In multifamily buildings, it's $500 per dwelling if you're paying below prevailing wage. $2,500 per dwelling for uh, a prevailing wage and above. Again, this has to be every contractor on the job site uh, to get this, not just the HVAC contractor. There's also a couple of rebate programs that, that we're pretty excited about um, because of, of how much money is on the table for folks. Um, but the downside of this is that these are state-based programs. Um, the reason I say the downside is that because it's a state-based program, it's going to take a lot longer to become available. Um, while the money has been uh, approved by Congress, it's currently with DOE, um, it's going to take several months for DOE to write or the guidance to get the money to the states, and then the states have to write their own rules and regulations in order for it to become available to you guys. But once these programs are up and running and we un get all of these unknowns known at that point, um, the, the intent of this program is to provide a point of sale rebate to consumers for electrification projects. Um, this means that you as a contractor, if your customer meets the income eligibility, and I'll talk about that in a second, can get a pretty major rebate based on uh, installing things like heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, uh, and things like that. Uh, now, likely, uh, we can maybe see some states starting as soon as uh, 2023, the first half of 2023, but most likely most states won't get uh, uh, ready with 
uh, these programs probably until the later part of 2023, maybe even 2024. Now, what all qualifies? Uh, this is based on the area median income. So uh, wherever you live has an area median income uh, that the Housing and Urban Development Agency releases. And so if you have a low income household, those making less than 80% of that, they will qualify for 100% of this list. Uh, if it's someone making moderate income, so greater than 80%, but less than 150%, they can qualify for 50% of the installation cost up to this list. So, you know, say you have a $16,000 uh, installation on a heat pump. If someone is a moderate income, they qualify for half the, that installation cost up to $8,000. Um, in addition to that, when you're looking at someone that's replacing a gas furnace with a heat pump, uh, they also qualify for you know $4,000 in service center upgrades. This is the breaker box, additional wiring, um, insulation, air sealing, ventilation sealing, uh, all of these together for a maximum rebate of $14,000. So it really is a, a pretty decent chunk of change uh, that that folks can use. Uh, to improve their homes, or if they're a landlord of someone that qualifies, they also qualify for that rebate. Now, in addition to this high efficiency electric home rebate program, we also have what's called the homes rebate. This one is not based on electrification. This one is only based on energy uh, efficiency by decreasing the amount of energy used. Uh, I just like the previous one, it's a state-based program, so there's a lot of unknowns until the states actually develop these programs. But the goal here is providing a rebate for achieving modeled energy efficiency. So, you know, if you have someone that has a very old gas furnace, if they can move from, say, a, you know, a 70 percent efficient gas furnace to a 95 percent new gas furnace, they achieve that 20 percent modeled energy reduction and they end up saving uh, about two thousand uh, dollars or 50 percent of the project cost which very likely with the, with the cost of product is going to be more than $4,000 and they will uh, uh, achieve that. If you can get up to a 35% modeled energy reduction, so replace both the furnace and the AC from very old inefficient models to the very new high efficiency models, you can actually get that up to $4,000 in credit. Uh, additionally, these credits are increased for folks that are in low or moderate uh, income households as well. The other great thing is that these incentives aren't standalone. Uh, so you can take uh, a state or local rebate, stack that on top of the tax incentives I mentioned. So say that $2,000 for a heat pump, plus whatever your state or local utility is offering, plus that $8,000 uh, uh, electrification rebate. All of these three can be stacked together to get a much larger rebate. The only limit is that you can't do both the heat pump and that homes rebate, the modeled energy efficiency one together, but otherwise you can stack any of the rest of these, providing a lot of opportunity for folks to get a, a fair amount of their uh, product or their, their equipment paid for through incentives and rebates. So uh, once these programs are up and running, and unfortunately for some states that may take 12 to 18 months, uh, they are gonna be very good incentives to, to use as a selling strategy uh, for your residential clients. The next thing I want to talk about is the federal HFC phase down. Uh, this is uh, based around the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act. Uh, this was passed in 2020 uh, by and signed by President Trump, where it directs the EPA uh, to develop regulations to phase down the production and consumption of HFC products between uh, 2022 all the way through 2036. Our goal as an industry is to work with the government to try and have an orderly transition uh, we saw what happened in Europe with their transition away from HFCs where they didn't do an orderly transition and it caused massive price spikes. That's what this graph here is on the right. Um, we're trying to avoid those as much as possible. We want a very long and slow phase out. And that's where you've probably seen a graph that looks like this before, where we are uh, doing slow phase downs over long periods of time, trying to uh, make it as smooth as possible so that no one is running into shortages of any of these products. Now, while you've probably seen this graph before, one of the things I want to better explain is what this graph really means. So uh, in this case, this is our production, uh, or excuse me, our consumption baseline. Um, so that number at the top is how much the U.S. uses HFCs. Then 
that number is converted into million metric tons of EVEs or exchange value equivalents. And every set of phase down for every year gets a certain number of basically building blocks of EVEs. So while in our 22 days when we were phasing out pounds of refrigerant, now we're phasing out EVEs. So uh, you guys have probably heard of an EVE just called a GWP or global warming potential. Uh, and what it does is it puts all HFCs on an equal footing. So, you know, if if you're a company that is given an allocation, you can produce X number of pounds of 410A, or you can make X number of pounds of 404A just based on how much of your allocation you're using. On the right-hand side, here's a, a visual way of putting that. One pound of 410A uses 2,088 uh, EVEs, whereas that pound, same pound of 404 would use 3,922. So you can produce a lot more 410A than you can 404A, or 134A is even smaller. When we start looking at our low GWP alternatives that are going to start coming on the market in the next couple of years, you can produce even more of those. And that's what produces this easy, smooth transition. You're allowing the companies to choose which uh, refrigerants that they're going to make using their allowances uh, so that that way uh, they know that they can meet market demand for what there is demand for, while at the same time using you know their incentive to to make money to produce more of the new refrigerants uh, that use less of an allocation. Uh, the way this gets broken down is that each year we have a certain allocation. Right now it is 273 million metric tons of EVEs per year, and but then in 2024 that number is going to decrease, and so. With these annual allocations, it's up to every company to decide how much of any individual product they want to make. And that's where we have to turn allocations into product. If each square here equals 1 million metric tons of EVE, uh, or roughly a billion kilograms of EVE, you have to, as a company, decide, what, how am I going to make my mix of products? I can make 255 metric tons of 404A, 479 metric tons of 410A, or I can make 1,481 metric tons of 32 or even more 454B. So if you're a company, you want to be able to produce the right mix of legacy ones like 404A and 410A, but also increase your production because you can sell more pounds of these newer products. So it's really going to be up to uh, these companies that produce them to meet market demand while also trying to shift demand into the newer products that they can make more of. Part of that is going to be when equipment transitions take place. And we're currently waiting on the EPA to release this rule, but these are the dates that we've asked for uh, for EPA. And the big one here for residential and light commercial, we have asked to move to uh, a manufacturers to start stop producing equipment that uses refrigerants greater than 750 GWP. So think, you know, all of our air conditioning equipment today that uses 410A, would stop being produced after January 1st, 2025. That would allow uh, us to sell products that use lower GWP refrigerants. In this case, there's a lot of them that are around uh, that meet this qualification for air conditioning. Uh, you know, everything from R32 here uh, down to uh, R457A uh, are all uh, common GW, low GWP refrigerants that are on the market. Luckily, uh, for the most part, most companies have chosen uh, only one or two. And actually, this list needs to be updated. There, I've got a couple of, of more that have announced. Uh, primarily, most manufacturers are choosing R454B. Uh, Daikin and Goodman are keeping with R32. You know, they, they manufacture it. It makes a lot of sense for them to, to, to go with that one. Uh, so while we had some fears because there was so many eligible refrigerants that you guys would just end up with truckloads of different cylinders, we're at least down to two, uh, which to me is is good news of what it could be. The uh, biggest thing, though, is that these are classified as A2L refrigerants, uh, what we call mildly flammable. So uh, ASHRAE has four, uh, technically eight sets of, of classifications, uh, toxicity versus higher toxicity, that's the A and the B. But really, when it's talking about 1, 2L, 2, and 3, how flammable those are. And so when we say mildly flammable, what we're really talking about is lower flammability. Um, think, of, uh, think of this as low heat of combustion and very slow burning velocity. Uh, so don't think of propane. Propane would be an A3. Uh, that is high flammability. This is low flammability. 
And so when we think of that heat of combustion, think of it as very similar to uh, somewhere between wet wood and dry wood. Uh, anyone that has gone camping and tried to cook a hamburger over a campfire knows it takes a lot longer for that hamburger to cook than it would if it was over a propane fire. And so that lower flammability does uh, definitely affect that the safety characteristics of it. It still can burn uh, in the same way A1s can burn, but A2Ls will stay lit uh, as long as they have enough fuel. So, uh, you know, as much as I can talk about you know, what this looks like from a perspective of, you know, things you maybe have seen before of, of, you know, campfires, things like that. I think the best way to show you is actually just to show you an example of us lighting uh, an A2L on fire. So uh, this is one of the scenarios that we set up. I like to think of this as a hotel room. Um, that's what that kind of structure in the middle is there. Uh, but then you have the PTAC on the wall. Uh, so the way we set this up was that as soon as that air conditioner turns on, when I press play, um, the compressor is going to fail and vent all of the, the refrigerant into the room. So, uh, you know, when this thing starts, uh, all of that refrigerant is now venting into the room. If you are sleeping on that bed and you notice it, uh, you're immediately going to wake up and go, I don't want to be in this room anymore because uh, refrigerant's not fun to be around. Now, if you randomly are a person that likes to travel, I guess, with a candle because it helps you make you sleep and you knock that over on the way out, what happens is we're about to see a small orange flame uh, light up by the air conditioner inside that red square that is us lighting a fire. Now look for the blue flame that is slowly moving away from the lit. That is the refrigerant itself actually on fire. And that's all the more that burns. Uh, what happens is it uh, refrigerants like these have what's called an LFL, a lower flammability limit. They have to have a certain concentration of refrigerant in a room mixed with oxygen in order to burn. Once you get rid, once you are below that LFL, it automatically extinguishes. Just to give you a better picture of what that looks like, uh, you know, we'll light that fire, and then that blue flame very slowly moves away where it's that slow burning velocity that I mentioned and low heat of combustion before it, it self extinguishes because it has lost, it does not have enough fuel to stay lit. Even though we're, you know, continuing that, that candle burning, uh, in this case, it's not actually a candle, but trying to light that uh, um, refrigerant on fire, it's just not happening. So clearly, uh, as much as we talk about flammability, uh, it is not as dangerous, I think, as a lot of people imagine. Uh, but it's still important for us to have a safe transition. And so um, we've created what's called the uh, Safe Transition Task Force, and it's all about making sure that we're doing the right things uh, to transition safely. And there's six parts to this. Uh, the building codes, transportation regulations, storage, contractor certification, reclaim and recovery, and then the allocation rule that I've already talked a lot about. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is building codes. Uh, building codes need to incorporate uh, safety standards. Uh, safety standards are developed by ASHRAE and Underwriters Laboratory, and they determine how to properly not only manufacture equipment, but install equipment. And so uh, updates are currently in process with the International Code Council for the International Mechanical Code and IATMO for the Uniform Mechanical Code. These are the, the two model codes that are used by virtually every state uh, to develop their building codes. Uh, and uh, we're also pursuing uh, state individual state updates to building codes. And in fact, right now, uh, you can install an A2L air conditioner or a refrigeration system. Uh, I believe it's uh, about 20 states right now. Uh, not too many in the in the northern states. Uh, North Dakota does allow uh, refrigerants in air conditioning. Uh, there should be A2L refrigerants in air conditioning. Uh, but if you're in Washington state, They've actually been installing R32 based um, mini splits uh, for almost eight months now. Uh, so very quickly, even though I said 2025, that is the deadline to stop manufacturing uh, 410 equipment. We will very likely see uh, equipment become available in these states uh, probably in 2024, if not 2023, uh, just because of that 2024 uh, uh, drop in production. So, uh, you know, Keep an eye out on this map. We're also very likely to see more states adopt next year uh, to allow uh, installation in 2024, and we'll make sure to keep you updated on that. 
Another major part of this uh, transition is transportation regulations, allowing you guys as contractors to haul equipment that's pre-charged with uh, A2Ls. And so right now, any pre-charged equipment containing less than 25 pounds per system uh, is allowed uh, thanks to a DOT letter of interpretation. There's not a whole lot of equipment larger than 25 pounds, but we are uh, seeking special permits to allow uh, even larger systems to be transported really in the commercial space. Uh, along with exempting bulk transport of A2L cylinders. So think of the folks that are driving the semis uh, with pallets of, of, of cylinders on them. Now, you as contractors uh, have what's called the materials of the trade exemption. This allows you to haul up to 440 pounds of A2L refrigerants without any changes to what you're doing today. Uh, you can you know haul them in uh, your, your standard racks and all of that without making any changes or any additional placarding. Uh, in the same way that transportation regulations need to be updated, we also have to update our fire code regulations on the storage of flammable gases. Uh, with that, we worked with the International Fire Code to increase uh, what are called maximum allowable quantities. So right now, if you are storing less than 20,000 pounds, which I imagine is most uh, uh, contractors, you don't have to change anything with how you are currently uh, storing them. If you're have storage and you're most likely a distributor where you're hauling storing more than 20,000 pounds you just have to have a certain sprinkler density uh and then for those folks that have large distribution centers uh where they're st hauling or storing more than 40,000 pounds up to 60,000 160,000 pounds excuse me they have to build what are called control areas to store the refrigerant basically separate rooms uh that are that are specially designed to withstand fires for up to an hour uh and then if you're greater than that even um, now we're really talking about uh, manufacturer level. They might have to ad build additional firewalls that have can withstand longer term fires or get what's called a, a hazardous occupancy. The next part is contractor certification. Um, this transition gives us a, a good opportunity to reevaluate the 608 program. Um, the EPA has been given very broad power on, on how to regulate the installation, um, servicing, repair, disposable of, of HVAC equipment uh, that uses A2Ls, or in, in fact, not even just A2Ls, just is uh, under this new AMAC jurisdiction. And so this very likely means that a new 608 program is coming, or at least a modified one. Uh, in fact, we met with, uh, there was a stakeholder meeting with, I uh, don't even know, I was probably 60 some people in it, uh, on Tuesday uh, with EPA talking about uh, the the next certification and, and how to work on this. And some of the things that were talked about is, you know, moving to technician level certification, um, ensuring that all technicians are certified, um, requiring a renewal of certification using continuing education credits, and then uh, stricter enforcement of certification requirements. Right now, uh, the only restriction as a contractor that has a 608 license, you can buy a uh, bulk refrigerant. Otherwise, anyone else without it can buy pre-charged equipment. We would like to move to where anything that is pre-charged requires this certification. Uh, this, this cuts down on folks who are not certified buying and improperly installing equipment uh, and is just safer overall, uh, especially as we move to A2Ls. Uh, the next part is on reclaim and recovery, and this is one where uh, we don't know enough, but we're definitely trying to know more. Uh, right now, we actually have uh, a surveys out to distributors and contractors asking about what are the current uh, methods of recovering refrigerant and going through the reclaim process. Um, how can we improve upon those processes from a government uh, policy uh, kind of angle? Because we want to increase recovery. Uh, with that major drop in production in 2024, we're going to need more reclaimed refrigerant to fill that gap to ensure that smooth transition that I've been talking about. We also want to pre you know, prevent mixing of gases in the field. Um, you know, With 410A being the primary air conditioning uh, gas makes it very simple, but on the refrigeration side, there's a lot of folks uh, that can be dealing with multiple gases. They don't necessarily know the history of a piece of equipment and whether um, it is pure gas inside that system or not. We want to do our best to make sure that, that pure gases are coming back to make that reclaim process easier. And then the last part of this is the allocation rule, which really I've already spent a lot of time talking about. Um, it is this graph, you know, it's it's how EPA sets those allocations, those little building blocks I was talking about earlier. However, one part I do want to talk about 
is the new enforcement and compliance measures that came about as part of this. Uh, the two major ones that affect you as contractors and us as distributors is the electronic tracking system for the movement of HFCs through commerce. They want to put QR codes on every cylinder and scan it as it's used. Um, then also requiring the use of refillable cylinders. There's two other requirements, but these do not apply uh, to uh, distributors and contractors specifically other than there's administrative consequences so if you do if you fail to meet these requirements you could be hit by those with the electronic tracking of cylinders like i mentioned it's putting qr codes on every uh cylinder or box that the cylinder comes in what they did was they uh, require the creation of a certification program by january 1st 2025 um, so as new cylinders are manufactured and filled, uh, starting in 2025, producers and importers must have a QR code on there. Uh, for those that get repackaged from large systems, large um, cylinders down to smaller cylinders, they will have to do that by 2026. And for every cylinder that leaves a distribution warehouse, uh, or distributor's warehouse starting in 2027 will have to have these QR codes. So there's a complete ban on any non-QR coded uh, cylinder after January 1st, 2027. And this comes with civil and criminal liability for selling uh, cylinders with an unreadable QR code. Our problem with this is you guys have, you know, taken your QR, your cylinders in and out of your trucks. You've seen how quickly that label gets scratched and, and destroyed. It's just frankly not a workable solution. And so uh, we want to find a different way of doing this tracking process. Um, and just frankly, how kind of absurd it is you know the the epa assigns a id uh to uh from the manufacturer and so the manufacturer then uh attaches that qr code scans it out of their warehouse when it's shipped to the distributor the distributor that has to scan it in to confirm ownership then the distributor has to transfer that ownership to the contractor where the contractor then uh takes the cylinder uses it and returns it back where then it all has to be scanned back up to the uh, the manufacturer of the of the um, refrigerant to be refilled because it's all refillable cylinders. So with this process, it's very unlikely that it's going to work well, uh, and and frankly, we as a trade association are very unhappy with it. In addition to that, oops, there we go. Uh, in addition, there's also the ban on disposable cylinders. Uh, following the exact same timeline, January 1st, 2025, all refrigerant cylinders must uh, be filled or must use refillable cylinders that are filled after January 1st, 2025. And then January 1st, 2027 is the deadline for all distributors to no longer sell single use disposable cylinders. Um, this this applies to any regulated substance. Uh, and the easy way to think about this is that R32 is a regulated substance and is used in virtually every uh uh, refrigerant that we will be using in, in this transition. So all new cylinders will have to become uh, uh, refillable. Uh, and the reasoning for this is to disincentivize illegal imports. Uh, it really has nothing to do with you as contractors. It's saying it's easier for Customs and Border Patrol to spot a, dis a refillable cylinder uh, and differentiate it from a disposable cylinder that would be that would likely contain illegal in, uh, uh, illegal imports of refrigerant. Frankly, it's an absurd claim because the illegal importers will just start using substandard uh, disposables or refillable cylinders that will likely not actually be able to be refilled. Uh, in addition, uh, the EPA, while not their reasoning, does claim that it could reduce up to 8% of the original quantity that's left in an empty cylinder, what's called the heel. Uh, and what that would do is reduce 5.2 million metric tons of CO2 equivalents. Uh, there are other Justification, but not reasoning, is that the U.S. is the only remaining developed country to use disposable cylinders. However, we are nothing like the other markets. The EU, Australia, India, and Canada uh, have all banned disposable cylinders, but are all significantly smaller markets than the United States. Uh, and lastly, Congress has asked EPA to investigate the use of, of disposable cylinders or refillable cylinders, but they've never required it. When this rule came out, uh, one of the first things we did was go and ask our members. You know, how do you feel about these requirements? And overwhelmingly, we got uh, negative feedback on both the ban on disposable cylinders and the electronic tracking, uh, which led us to file a lawsuit with uh, the EPA uh, saying we do not believe the EPA has the authority to re uh, 
to institute these two requirements, the QR code tracking or the uh, refillable cylinder requirement. And uh, we're actually moving to our what's called oral arguments in front of a three judge panel next week. Uh, that is the last stage before we will get a judgment sometime in the next 12 months uh, on whether or not the EPA exceeded their authority. So we're hoping to have some good news on that one. Uh, and but overall, we are expecting to have a, a very good and thought out transition to the next generation of refrigerants. And hopefully you guys as contractors will be able to take advantage of this, uh, along with the incentives that I talked about uh, and the new energy efficiency requirements to make sure that your customers are getting the products that, that they want uh, without majorly affecting the, the prices through, a, through an unsteady transition. Uh, and with that, I am happy to take any questions. I know I've just thrown a very large amount of information at you guys. Is anybody there? We have a question that says, how can I print this out? We can share, hey, uh, Alex, can we share this presentation with everybody after the fact? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure that you guys get a PDF um, that you can, can share widely. I mean, obviously you can't show a video on a PDF, but that's, you know. Right. <laughs> That's the only that's the only part that won't be included because okay. you know, just how it yeah, works. We will send that out to everybody. We'll send out the recording and we'll send out the uh, PDF of this presentation for you guys. If you have any other questions, please submit them in chat. Just getting a bunch of thank yous, Alex, and I would agree. <laughs> thank you for making this uh, what I think is pretty complicated information in a very uh, simplistic language for us. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I I want to talk to as many contractors as possible because we know there's a lot of, of changes coming um, and they're coming at different times. You know, we, we wish that the energy efficiency and the HFC were all lined up. It just unfortunately isn't working out that way, but want to, you know, give you guys all of the information so that you are making good business decisions about these transitions. All right, last call for questions. All right, you're just getting a whole bunch of thank yous. Thank you so yeah, much, and, Alex. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and when you get the slides, my email will be on there. Feel free to shoot me an email uh, or, you know, to anyone uh, uh, that helped organize this and they can connect me with you as well. We do have one last question. So someone said, so basically the only thing in place now are the tax credits rebate wise, correct? Yes. So today we have the old tax credits are in place on January 1st. The improved tax credits will become available sometime in the future. Could be 12 months. It could be 18 months. It could be six months. Those those large dollar rebates will, will be put in place and we will be sure to scream it from the rooftops once those things are available. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you guys.